Where does a prince go when he is looking for a glass slipper in the sport utility market? Canada, of course. That's this week on Motoring 98. TSN's Motoring 98 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas for new, longer-lasting, performance friction carbon metallic brake pads. This week I am driving the world's newest luxury sport utility vehicle. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 98. Now this vehicle is not built in the United States, Germany or Japan. In fact, it is not built by any major car manufacturer. Now this vehicle is manufactured in Barrie, Ontario. It is designed and built by one man for one very special customer. And oh by the way, the name of the vehicle, Desert Shadow. Racing fans may remember George Feger. He raced Can-Am and Indy cars back in the 60s, even raced alongside Mario Andretti. But George could not only drive the cars, he could also design and build them, like this early Indy car owned by George Eaton. Today, in a soon-to-be-expanded garage in Barrie, Ontario, George and his son Robert are working seven days a week on the hottest sport utility in Saudi Arabia, the Desert Shadow with a price tag of around 125,000 American. Well, right now, most of the people there who, who can afford a decent vehicle to drive, it's either a Land Rover or they drive a Suburban. Uh, mind you, they're all fully loaded vehicles with every amenity you could possibly imagine. But um, our vehicle, we got the idea because the vehicle that we put them on, the donor, which is the GMC Crew Cab, it's a comfortable vehicle already because of what the electronics, the engine, so it's a well-known vehicle. And also, it has a good name. So it's not an unknown product. And what we do is we improve on that. We do this, the frame modifications, everything, to be able to handle the climate that's going to be going to, plus the uh, obstacles that are going to be in its path. Once the prototype was built, it was time to take it to the Mideast for a test drive. Um, there's several shows throughout the world where they market all-terrain vehicles, 6x6 six six vehicles. But the primary one was in uh, the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi. It's uh, called the IDEX show. It happens every two years. And uh, when we went to the show, there was various vehicles from all over the world that were uh, either just launching or already launched but with newer modifications. And uh, pretty much you test the vehicles against all, all the other ones there and ours came out on top. My dad's pretty much the backbone of the company. He's, uh, he's the one that knows all the trades involved in putting a vehicle of such caliber out on the market. It's not a vehicle that can be built on an assembly line. It's a vehicle that requires someone of such a talent that they can, they can pretty much do any aspect of the vehicle. And uh, my dad uh, fills that position. <laughs> uh, we completely re modify the frame, reinforce the, the whole, whole uh, C-section because it's a C-section design frame on a GM. And uh, usually those kind of designs, they twist, which, uh, which is one of the problems if you're off-road. You know, you, you have to have a solid frame. The front end of a vehicle is quite weak on a, on a, on a standard GM truck when you take it off-road. So we had to reinforce the whole front end. Again, uh, we have a new structure under the hood which stabilizes the the twist from the frame. Down in the Middle East, you have a big problem with vehicles surviving in a desert climate because every day you get a climate of probably 40 degrees Celsius on a daily basis. So your vehicle has to incorporate both a heavy duty um, cooling system naturally because of the heat, plus a very lightweight vehicle because if you don't have the lightweight, you sink in the sand. That's more or less the, uh, the biggest difficulty most vehicles face down there. And even the gas tank, for example, this vehicle that we have, it can go about 1,200 kilometers on a full tank of diesel. I mean, there's not too many vehicles that can do that, especially in the desert. The vehicle that most associate with the desert is the Hummer, 
which gained popularity during the Gulf War. But well, the Hummer itself is a good vehicle. I mean, it proved itself to the U.S. military down there. But the Hummer is it's not it's not a comfortable vehicle. It looks interesting. That's what it is. It's an interesting vehicle. But ours is primarily based for recreational, taking it out on the road on the weekend in comfort. I mean, you sit in the back of this truck, it's like sitting at home on your sofa. Right now, at the position we're in, we have other orders that we have to fill before we can hit our own market. It's, I know it's not a nice thing to say, you know, first you'd, you'd think we'd take care of our own or in, the, in our own country, but we sort of started with the Middle East, so we have to finish off there before we can move into here. Well, I, I love doing it. I, I, I love building vehicles. I don't like it too much when it goes into production, you know, because then when you do all, every day the same thing, it gets boring. But the new, new, new designs is really exciting. I, I like to spend the time with it. So I'm, I'm working, you know, seven days a week, but I enjoy it. The need for the racetrack is to find out where the edge of the envelope lies. And the advantage of doing that on a racetrack is that if you do happen to step outside of the envelope, usually you and the car live to tell the tale. You know, one of the true joys of test drive is being able to take a street car out onto a racetrack and not have to worry about replacing the brakes and the tyres after you've finished thrashing around. Well, on this edition of Test Drive, our guinea pig is the all-new Mercury Cougar. The track? Well, it's Road Atlanta. Cougar is suspended by compact, low-friction McPherson strut design up front and a Quadralink independent rear suspension that incorporates passive rear wheel steering. The latter induces toe-in during hard braking or cornering, improving stability. It also minimizes the potential for the rear end to break away under extreme conditions. During my time behind the wheel, the design had the desired effect, allowing the Cougar to negotiate the Road Atlanta racetrack at serious speeds without feeling at all skittish. Cougar is also a good example of walking that fine line between ride comfort and the handling requirements of a sports car. Many wonderful sports cars handle like the Dickens when needed, but tend to beat the passengers up during the daily drudgery that defines the morning commute. Cougar does not. The steering gear has a very European flavour, meaning a crisp feel, good feedback and a much faster response to directional input than most North American cars. Rounding out the package are a large set of low-profile 215-50R16 tyres that supply the requisite level of grip. There you go, 112 feet from ADK and a great pedal. You'd think everything was hunky-dory, but it's not. Anti-lock brakes are an expensive option, as in about 700 bucks. I understand why they're an option on the four-cylinder model, because that is a price-sensitive market. On the V6, it's a big mistake. And no, I don't buy Ford's rather inane excuse. They've had too many complaints. They've had too many people complaining they don't know how to use anti-lock brakes. Power comes from Ford's tried and true Duratec 2.5 liter V6. The 60 degree V features 24 valves, twin overhead camshafts, and a dual phase intake manifold. The result is 170 horsepower at 6,250 RPM and 165 pounds feet of torque. 90% of which is available anywhere above 2,000 RPM. As a result, the Cougar hauls rather nicely, requiring just over 8 seconds to run through the 100k mark. Matched with this engine is a slick shifting 5-speed do-it-yourselfer that is as smooth and refined as any available. You know, the interior of the Cougar has been very well thought through. You get a great view of a good set of gauges Plus the things like the power windows, locks and mirrors sit high enough up that they sit in your usual line of sight. However, what I cannot forgive is that when you have the coffee cup holder up, you cannot use the parking brake. Now admittedly, with an automatic transmission, it doesn't make a whole pile of difference. However, with a standard transmission like this one, it sure does, because it promotes riding the clutch. And when you ride the clutch, you're going to burn it out. And guess what? When you do burn it out, it'll be on your ticket because it's not covered under warranty. 
The rear environment is less appealing, with both head and leg room being tight. The seat base is also shaped such that your legs are forced up at an awkward angle. Now, provided you look upon the space as being suitable for young children or a handy place to put your briefcase, these comments should not be of any great concern. Cougar merely follows the standard set for a sporty coupe. I know Ford or Mercury won't like me for saying this, but no locking gas cap on a $25,000 car. Naughty, naughty. You know, despite my criticisms, this 1999 Mercury Cougar is a very nice piece of machinery. It's got a great engine, at least if you go with a V6, and both transmissions offered work very well with that engine. The handling characteristics are perhaps the benchmark in this class of car, and they've achieved this without sacrificing anything in the ride department. The part that I like the best, though, is the hatchback configuration. I think it adds a great deal of versatility to a rather attractive looking car. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me now introduce to you the Honda MV. 99. Uh, this new minivan is a kind of a progression for Honda. We started with the Odyssey and uh, now we have a, a bigger platform to work with. Um, on the, uh, the outside of the show minivan, uh, you should be seeing pretty much what you're going to see in the fall of 98 when we introduce this minivan. Um, the interior, however, is going to be uh, uh, different uh, than the show minivan. The show minivan, we've kind of uh, uh, experimented with some different colors and different ideas, different concepts, just to test the public's reaction uh, and uh, have a little fun too. And um, in the same way that uh, an Accord has kind of set a standard for sedans, I think this minivan will also do the same for minivans. As usual, nobody could knock the quality of the Honda Odyssey, the company's first venture into this segment. The biggest complaint, though, was size and the lack of it. Yes, it was a concern. The Odyssey was uh, a, a, certainly a very good uh, entry option for us. It gave us a product that fit right in between the offerings from Chrysler in terms of their short versus long wheelbase. So that was very important for us. But uh, this is definitely a full-size van. It's uh, going to compete size-wise as large as uh, any of the vehicles in, in that uh, segment of the market. The MV99 will be built at Honda's plant in Allison, Ontario, with a planned production of 120,000 annually. No word yet about the future of the Odyssey. Our Midas tip of the week concerns engine oil capacity. Most of today's cars hold about four liters of oil, but many of the smaller engines hold even less than that. In any case, it's that volume of oil that not only lubricates the engine, but cools a lot of parts as well. There's the bottom of the engine's cooling system right there, that drain bolt. Everything above that receives benefit of the engine coolant. But below that area, the entire bottom end of the engine relies on oil to cool it as well as lubricate it. Now you want the right amount in there, of course. There's the pickup unit and the oil pump, and there's our dipstick over there. If we grossly overfill that engine with oil, the counterweights on the crankshaft will start to plow through the oil and aerate it. If it's grossly below that level, the oil pump can become starved for oil and you can seize the engine. So make sure you maintain the correct amount of oil in that engine. Your engine oil will last longer and the critical parts of your engine will be not only lubricated but cooled properly as well. That's your Midas tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 98 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. It all started with the Prowler, which now comes in yellow, by the way. Introduced as a concept car, Chrysler surprised many of the old boys by putting the car into production. Until then, most concepts ended up in somebody's basement. Well, every year now, the public expects more concepts from Chrysler. This year, Chrysler did not disappoint, unveiling the Plymouth Pronto Spider, the Chrysler Kronos, and the Jeep Jeepster. And what's fascinating about them is I can make a case for building all three of them, but they're all independent studies. And uh, the, the Plymouth Pronto Spider, for example, is a plastic vehicle. 
I could make a great case that says that this is something we should do as a test bed to develop this plastic technology and to get it into limited production before we uh, decide to put it into mass production. The Chrysler Kronos, great flagship car, great historic car, wonderful proportion, great for the, the top of the Chrysler line, I don't know, $100,000 range or something close to that. I mean, it's going to be an expensive vehicle. But it's got a 6-liter V10 engine, uh, rear wheel drive, 20-inch, 21-inch wheels and tires, a humidor between the seats, real wood on the instrument panel, all other seating surfaces. I mean, it is, it is truly a car that says, I've made it and I'm really proud of this car, and proud of what it makes me look like when I'm driving it. The Jeep Jeepster might be a new definition of a segment that's kind of in between where a sports car is and when our sport utility is. Uh, I mean, it's kind of uh, disappointing, I guess, that we can't do all of them, but you can't do all of them. I mean, you just, you just can't. You just dilute your mix too much. You, you end up spending all your time doing these limited production cars and don't spend enough time doing the production ones. We're back in Barrie, Ontario with our Desert Shadow. As we saw earlier, George Fiedra has made a lot of changes to this GMC pickup truck. In the front, though, the suspension remains the same with torsion bars. But in the back, a different story. Take a look at this. See how much higher this tire is than the other one? Yet the body is perfectly level, exactly 14 inches from right to left. That is the result of a patent suspension system developed by George using air springs. And in Saudi Arabia, with those high sand dunes, it comes in very handy in alleviating any rollover possibility. All right, now let's head back in time and join the young Bill Gardner. Here's a tire that's well-worn, but evenly worn all the way across. You can see the wear bars exposed on this tire right here. Here we have a couple of units with classic examples of radiator failure. After you've made your visual inspection, start the engine and make sure that that damper in the air cleaner snorkel closes. If it doesn't, start tracing the vacuum system backwards until you find the problem. Now here's that starter motor you just saw a minute ago on the pickup truck. Each week, Bill Gardner shares with us his wisdom of the car. He offers us tips on maintenance and tries to simplify a subject that for many can be confusing and downright intimidating. But who is this guy and has he always been a mechanic? I came out of high school and you know, needed a job. I'd, I'd been working part time at a garage and uh, the fall at the garage said, well, why don't you start your apprenticeship under me? So I learned from uh, that particular fellow that I worked for part time and I uh, did my apprenticeship under him, got, got my license all at that same shop. And uh, I never really decided, you know, there was no one set time where I decided to be a mechanic. It just kind of happened, you know. It was something that uh, I was comfortable with. I already had a few tools and a little bit of know-how and uh, thought I knew what I was doing, but I found out the hard way that there was a lot more to learn. And I think it's something that's really uh, got to be in your blood, you know. You, you, uh, you're destined to do that because it sure doesn't make any sense uh, financially or uh, it's not the greatest job in, in many respects, but uh, I don't regret it. Although Bill has complete confidence when it comes to tackling problems under the hood, he does admit to some apprehension when we approach them to go in front of the camera every week. It, it was tough at first. Uh, it was really tough. And, you know, I, I felt pretty guilty about uh, the amount of tape that we uh, wasted on, on flubs at, at my end. It, it was really difficult. If you have an older car where that system has gone into failure and you're about to empty your wallet to repair it, think twice because I can tell you you're going to spend a lot of money resurrecting those old systems and you may never get them right. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 90. One. <laughs> now before we can remove the trim panel, it's necessary to remove some of the hardware that protrudes through that panel. For example, this lock knob has to come off and we're going to have to remove these little decorative covers. They just pop off. Real f and easy, as you can see. You know, nobody's going to care for your car the way you are. You know, I mean, you've got the time and the interest to, to do everything right. You can maintain tire pressures. You can check filters. You can, there's a hundred different things you can do on a car that will keep, you know, maintain that car in good shape. So if you can eliminate uh, a lot of those things that, that many people pay other guys to do, you know, I don't know how many times we get cars in for brake and suspension work that have really soft tires. There's no excuse for a guy driving around on really soft tires. That's something he should be maintaining himself. But, you know, obviously when the car's in for that kind of work, we have to address that situation. We find ourselves doing 
all kinds of tasks that owners really should be taking an interest in. And if they did, boy, they'd save a lot of money. Taxi, taxi. Wait, wait a minute, that, that's a minivan. A New York taxi minivan? Coming up next on Kenzie's Corner. If you live in Manhattan, you probably figure all cars are yellow and have lights on the roof. And if you live in Manhattan, you can't believe that Chevrolet is going to be discontinuing the production of the full-size Caprice, because after all, that's all you see here. Now, the New York City Taxi Commissioner has been reaming General Motors executives up one side of the street and down the other. What are we going to do for cabs if they don't have the full-size Caprice? I mean, a couple of guys run Ford Crown Victorias, but frankly, they don't stand up to the kind of punishment that New York can dish out. Some people think the minivan is the answer. There, in fact, is one Honda Odyssey running around the streets of New York as we speak. Hey, when that guy has to replace his power steering pump, his accountant is going to choke. Now, in San Antonio, Texas, they use Dodge Caravans. Every 100,000 miles or so, they drop the front subframe, throw the engine transmission suspension away, bolt in a new one, and get another 100,000 miles out of it. But the streets of San Antonio aren't the streets of Fort Apache, the Bronx, if you know what I'm saying. So what are they going to do? Well, you know, I pretty much have an answer for every problem, but this one, hey, I haven't got a clue. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, they're putting the final few touches on Desert Shadow number three, and any day now it'll be headed over to Saudi Arabia, and it'll be in the driveway of the royal family. Now, if you look real closely back there, you will see a Hummer, and it is owned by Canadian All-Terrain Manufacturing. The reason is quite simple. Any prospective buyer is more than welcome to compare the vehicles. They're quite confident which one will come out on top. And incidentally, on a future program, we hope to put Desert Shadow and the Hummer head to head. You won't want to miss it. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. You tell me what happened. Well, I was trying this uh, typical slope, and uh, I guess I uh, need more experience. I got into the descent. I think they'll get you out, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is part of the fun, right? TSN's Motoring 98 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. And Midas, for new, longer-lasting performance friction carbon metallic brake pads.